begin transmission. You know, even throughout my very long and uh, rather illustrious career, I have given thousands of mission reports, and yet I still find it unnatural to be talking directly to a camera. And so I've been trying to figure out ways where I can make it more, uh, more personal, more relatable, and will help me um, kind of deliver the excitement I feel about these new organisms to this, this dead screen. So um, on board we have a few people who are quite creative, two in particular, an older one and a younger one. And so what I had them do was draw me a picture of a person that I could then post right behind the camera so I can look at that person instead of just looking at this, this blank screen and imagining um, beautiful faces. So the older one created this guy here. This is Josh and he will be uh, my audience. The younger one created this one here. Like, like, like this, we got, we got eyes, he even drew a nice little beard and a mustache. Um, this, one's, this one's Josh, this one's Alfredo, and these will be my audience members. So I will just uh, put them on the screen right here. Make sure everything's still all visible. And now I can tell Josh about my day. There you go, perfect. Well, Josh, my days my days uh, been been pretty good. Um, I mean, the last few days have been rough because we've uh, we've lost a member of the crew, poor Doctor Astronomer, and you know I don't want to make this all about me, uh, Joshua, um, but. Losing her, she was a, a valuable member of the crew for sure. Um, she was our astronomer, cosmologist, but also she was our cosmetologist. And without her around, there is now no one who will cut our hair. Which, you know, again, I don't want to make this all about me, but I had made an appointment with her just last week to get my hair cut, but I canceled it. I postponed it to this week because I was making these exquisite videos and didn't have time to get my hair cut. Um, so now I have no one to cut my hair. Um, I don't know how long it will be before I can get my hair cut. So uh, there may be dark days ahead. I may have to cut my hair myself or it just might just might keep growing longer and longer and longer. We'll see. Uh, but that's something I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with now is, is not having someone to cut my hair. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me, Josh. You're, you, are, you are a good listener. Um, secondly, I wanted to mention, um, no, that was the second thing. Two things, yeah, new, uh, new face that I, can, that I can watch and uh, who will, uh, a very attentive, attentive, yeah, attentive student. Um, did you have a question? I thought I, thought I saw it, you raised your hand. Yeah, it's, it's fine, yeah, so we got, we got a new, uh, new face and I'm struggling with my hair. Um, but that's that's uh, that's what's new in my life for for today. What we're going to talk about today are three new organisms that we've discovered. Three quite interesting organisms. Only one of which is a parasite, but the parasite is quite gruesome, um, as you should expect by now. Although it doesn't infect humans, so we didn't find this parasite in in um, any member of the crew. Rather, we were collecting some of these of these arthropod like creatures. These ones with these these hard armor plates around their um, insides, and one of them, uh, one of the members of the crew, um, rhymes with Bave. He got frightened because it had too many legs and too many eyes, according to him, so he sprayed it with a toxic chemical. And when he sprayed this poor little creature with a toxic chemical, it died, but one, one thing emerged from the wrecked body of this, this poor creature was as follows. This squirmy, wormy thing emerged from the dead corpse of its host. So humans are not the only thing that is infected by parasites. And in fact, some of the worst parasites attack organisms that are much um, smaller than us and proportionately are almost as, um, the, the parasites are almost as large as their hosts. So we went out and collected a whole lot of these arthropods and we put them in water. And what we found was that in many species, their abdomens are filled to 
complete fullness with a worm-like creature, um, not a segmented worm, um, uh, more of a nematode-like worm, but it's not a nematode either. They don't have the same traits as nematodes. And as you can see here, emerging from the abdomen of this arthropod, we tested uh, 15 different species so far, and each of them have, about 1% of them, have these, these organisms inside them. Pretty creepy, pretty gruesome. Um, so we'll talk about these. We're calling them nematomorphs. They're not quite nematodes, but they're similar. So they're going to be the close relatives, of the nematomorphs. And then we'll talk about velvet worms and water bears. The three groups we'll talk about today are the nematomorphs, the onycophorans, and the tardigrades. And these are three really distinct, very strange uh, phyla that are kind of similar to annelids, similar to nematodes, similar to arthropods, but are not any of those things. So we don't really know exactly what these groups are, are related to. Some people consider them to be more similar to annelids, some more similar to arthropods like insects and um, centipedes. Uh, but regardless, they're kind of a confusing um, mosaic of features, of, of morphologies that are kind of annelid-like and others that are more arthropod-like. This picture right here is of a velvet worm, and you can see some extensions off its um, body that appear to be leg-like. And so it almost kind of looks like a caterpillar or maybe a soft little centipede, uh, or maybe just a worm with some specialized parapodia. And, but its mouth looks strange. Where are its eyes? Does it have eyes? What are these things anyway? Uh, they're not eyes. Um, so we'll, we'll leave this mystery for now. We'll talk about velvet worms in a minute. But first, we need to talk about the nematomorphs. Nematomorphs are horsehair worms, um, because when we saw some in a stream, the first time we saw them, they kind of looked like threads, little threads of, of horses' hair swimming around in the water. So the common name are horsehair worms. They're, uh, a lot of them are fairly long, and they look quite a bit like nematodes. Now, they're different from nematodes, um, unique in that they don't have any amphids. Amphids are the unique um, uh, parts of the cuticle around a nematode's mouth that contain olfactory and sensory um, uh, cells. So amphids are a nematode's anapomorphy. Nematomorphs don't have any of those, otherwise they're, they're quite similar to nematodes. So nematodes with amphids, nematomorphs without amphids. The metamorphs also do, as adults, don't contain a gut, um, a complete digestive system. So most of the nutrients they, they get, they get as juveniles or they absorb through their cuticle. Common name, as I mentioned, are horsehair worms. And these, um, these worms have a, a very, very fascinating life cycle. They are parasites, but they're parasites of arthropods. They're not parasites of vertebrates. And as far as we can tell, they usually only have a single host. And these are the worms that we saw from the praying mantis and the cricket, and um, we found some in beetles. They seem to parasitize just about anything that um, is a terrestrial arthropod that drinks water, which is almost all of them. They grow as adults inside their the abdomens of their host. Oftentimes, they are significantly longer um, and larger in size than their hosts are themselves. And so they basically ex, um, fill the entire abdominal cavity of their host with their own body as they grow, eating away the organs, the digestive system, the reproductive organs, the, the fat body, which is um, uh, kind of the immune system of the, of the arthropod, and instead fill all that space with their own body. They reproduce in the water, though, and to get back to the water, they have a, a really interesting way of manipulating their host to get back to the water. If you remember um, from Earth's history, Dracunculiasis was caused by a nematode that kind of manipulated its human host to uh, get back to the water by creating a heat blister that we would then put in the water. Uh, well, the nematomorphs similarly manipulate their host behavior, but it's a lot more direct. The nematomorphs secrete uh, a mimic of, a pro of an insect protein that controls neurological and hormonal behavior and throws off the circadian rhythm of their hosts. So the circadian rhythm is basically day-night cycles 
And uh, what happens is it manipulates its host to seek out large bodies of water and then throw themselves in. And um, the host doesn't um, usually do this. In fact, they're usually not very good swimmers and the host often drowns in the process. So the horsehair worms almost uh, cause their host to commit suicide. Um, and this usually happens at night. So uh, the, the horsehair worm can sense when it is day and when it is night and it will secrete these manipulating hormones, um, these proteins at night. If the worm, if the host lasts throughout the whole night and uh, no suitable body of water was found to throw itself into for the, uh, the worm to escape, then the worm will kind of uh, stop secreting the hormone for the day. So when the sun rises, the worm gives control back to its host, and then when the next night falls, the worm regains control of its host, which is very creepy. You could make a pretty good legend from, from this type of creature, especially if it attacked a human, and you know, taking control of a human at night and then releasing control during the day. Um, a pretty, pretty horrific stories could result from that idea. Um, eventually, the host will find a body of water and will throw itself in. The worm will wind itself out, usually through the anus or through a hole it burrows um, itself. And then it will find a fellow horsehair worm. And as you can see here in this, uh, this picture here, it's a, a nice writhing mating ball of multiple horsehair worms all together. They will lay eggs in the water um, around vegetation. And then when an insect, a cricket, a beetle, a prey mantis, comes along and eats um, vegetation or drinks water from uh, this little pool, then they will get infected with the eggs. So the juvenile worms grow inside the abdomen of their arthropod host. The adults um, secrete a protein that manipulates the host to throw itself into large bodies of water. And then the adults emerge, find a mate, uh, and lay eggs. So that's the general life cycle of nematomorph horsehair worms. The representative genus of phylum nematomorph that you should know is Gordius. Gordius is named after that, uh, that ancient tail of the Gordian knot, because when these, when these worms get together in a nice mating ball, they, they just look like a, a tremendous rope has tied itself into a knot. And if you don't know the story, it's a pretty interesting story of the Gordian knot. There is a, a land a long, 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 long time ago, and one of the, the greatest conquerors in history, um, Emperor Alexander, um, there was a legend that in the, in the area, if you could untie this, this gigantic Gordian knot, um, then you would be king of all of macadamia. And so Alexander, he wanted to unite uh, the whole region and become um, emperor. Um, and so what he did was he he tried untying it for a while, but he got frustrated, and then he just drew his sword and sliced through the knot, thereby untying it and fulfilling the prophesy, prophecy. Unfortunately, he um, that he is, that's cheating a little bit, right? The, the goal was to untie the knot, not, not slice through it. That's cheating a little bit. So he was cursed with a horrible skin condition and it turned um, his face kind of a deep shade of purple. And um, I, think, I think that's why he became known as Alexander the Grape. But I'm not a, I'm not a student of history necessarily, so uh, the, the, the details in that story might be wrong. But at any rate, uh, we named this, uh, this worm Gordius after the famous Gordian knot of um, King Alexander. Uh, Onychophorans are the velvet worms, and velvet worms are fascinating, fascinating creatures. They seem to be re restricted to the, the moist jungle forest area um, around us. They, they're not in deserts or in marine environments. They have a soft cuticle, so it's not a, a hard, thick, chitinous cuticle like the arthropods, and it's, uh, it's not um, uh, sturdy like the nematode cuticle either. It's kind of soft. It still has some chitin and protein components to it, but it's kind of soft. So these are called the velvet worms. And they kind of look like worms. They have tentacles, um, they have little um, antenna that are reminiscent of annelid um, antenna, and they have the same kind of ocelli at the base of their antennae that the um, that annelids have as well. And on the inside, they are, um, their nephridial system, their water filtration system is segmented. So they have some attributes of annelids, 
At the same time, these little extensions here are not parapodia. They don't occur on every single segment. You can see actually little, little lines here. These are not parapodia, they are actually little legs. But unlike the arthropods that have jointed legs, these are just kind of um, water-filled um, extensions of their body. They're unjointed, um, so they kind of look like a little uh, caterpillar's pro legs um, a little bit. So very strange organisms, restricted to moist tropical areas, and um, one in really interesting thing about them that makes them unlike anything else on this whole planet um, is their ability to capture prey with these slime cannons. So right underneath their antennae, they have these, these specialized glands that make a, uh, a slime that's liquid until it hits the air and then it hardens almost immediately on contact. And so they, they find their prey and then they shoot these slime cannons at it, entangling it and gluing it down so that it can't escape, which is remarkable. Seems like a fairly inefficient way, but it's also a spectacular way to catch your prey. When they get close to their prey, they have this little extensible jaw, um, this little tooth knife-like thing that they will use to stab their prey, and then they'll uh, slurp up the insides. So here you can see the, the slime cannons here in their antenna. Their eyes are just little um, ocelli here, and then their mouth with the protrusible knife. Very strange animals. Uh, Parapatus, um, a little peri, the velvet worm, is our representative genus that you should know here. And uh, Parapatus and some of its other relatives are um, velvet worms, so you know you should know the traits and where they live and their hunting behaviors. Also, something very unusual about these is their their brains are actually fairly well developed. They have a, a fairly complex nervous system. And uh, especially in some of these uh, species are social. So they have little family units and extended family groups that they will hunt and live together with. These are matriarchal, and so there will be a single dominant female. And if you, um, if you know the, the, myth, the mythological creatures, lions, uh, lions kind of hunt in the same way, um, at least that's the rumor. And when one uh, the lions had a distinct eating hierarchy. Usually it was males first, and then females, and then cubs. And we see the same pattern here with um, communal hunting in um, social velvet worms. So when they hunt together, the matriarch always gets to eat first, and then um, her offspring, and then the sub-adults, and then their offspring. And there's a distinct hierarchy. And if you if you cross that, if you um, if someone who's not supposed to eat eats, then they get attacked by the others, especially the, the dominant matriarch. And so you have a complex social system going on that actually have, has a, a dominance hierarchy, which um, in, in humans at least, this requires some kind of level of um, internal awareness, a self-awareness, an aware that you are an entity and that there's another entity that's something else. This is kind of a, a basic concept of how dominance hierarchies are, are formed. And so their brains may be uh, a lot more capable of kind of um, simple consciousness than, than you might think if you ran across this little velvet worm um, in the soil around your house. Very fascinating creatures. Our last specimen uh, belongs to another unique phylum, uh, phylum tardigrada, and these are the water bears. These are small organisms, uh, microscopic. You can actually see here these little pink pill-like things, those are bacterial cell um, cells. So this is a very small creature, but it's got eight legs, similar to a velvet worm. They're not jointed. At the end, they have these nice claws, which they use to kind of crawl through the substrate. They live, again, they're restricted to moist areas. They are found in abundance around um, uh, moss and lichen. So if you find some moss and you squeeze it out into a, a petri dish and look at it under a microscope, you might be able to see some of these uh, very unusual looking creatures. These water bears are um, one of the most fascinating creatures we've want to run across here. Um, they find prey and then they have these stylets, these hard stylets that they use to, sh to shoot out um, and spear their prey. They also have a, a highly muscular pharynx that they can uh, zoom out to slurp the prey up. 
The most fascinating thing about these things, however, is something that they do when um, their habitat dries out. Um, because like I said, they, ha they live in moss and um, it re re require moisture and these are often ephemeral. So they'll, they'll be moist one day and then a few months later they won't be, uh, depending on rainfall in the region. So what they do is something called uh, cryptobiosis. Uh, cryptobiosis is a dehydration of their cells, uh, dehydration of their whole body. It forms this, this nice little barrel shaped little just package of water bear. And this little water bear package can withstand desiccation and temperature change. And we've actually done a whole lot of experiments on it. And it turns out it can withstand um, the vacuum of space and it can withstand gamma radiation. And it, we can freeze it and we can heat it and we can put uh, caustic chemicals on it and it just persists. It just, it just continues to live. So it is, it is a remarkable cyst-like um, state. It's a deep hibernation, a cryptobiosis. And it's, it is in a lot of ways, it's better than our, our, our own invented deep space hibernation. So I think we could, by studying these, we could probably come up with a way that we could, uh, we could extend our deep space hibernation and maybe even go explore more and new planets. Our uh, genus here that we need to learn is Echiniscus. He is a water bear uh, belonging to Phylum tardigrada, tardigrada. Here you can see here, the cute little guy. You can see, see his little muscular pharynx extending out. Eight legs, which is very unusual. Not a lot of creatures have eight stumpy little legs. Some people um, have suggested uh, it may actually be possible that um, these water bears, because they can survive in the vacuum of space and because they can um, withstand gamma radiation. And then a third really unique trait is that their, their DNA is very, very different than everything else. So we don't really know where, they're, where they are placed phylogenetically. Um, if they're closely re related to arthropods or velvet worms or annelids or what, because the, their DNA is very, very, very different. And um, it, t it turns out the reason it's different is because they can actually accumulate environmental DNA from, uh, from outside their bodies and incorporate it into their own genome. So there are little bits of DNA floating all around us. Uh, the water bears are able to just grab some and stuff it into their bodies and um, transcribe it like they would their own genomes. So they have genetic material from a huge range of organisms. And if, it, if it's helpful, then it gets passed down. If it's not, then um, it, it doesn't. So really, really remarkable organisms. Um, I was going to say that some people, given those three traits, surviving the vacuum of space, forming um, these cryptobiotics um, cysts that can survive for uh, a very, very long time. We actually don't know how long they can survive, apparently indefinitely. And because their DNA is so different from, uh, from all life um, here, some people have specula speculated that if, um, if an asteroid would hit this planet, it could potentially, statistically and probably, but... Um, uh, potentially it could pick up some cryptobiotic cysts of water bears and then transport those to a different planet, thus seeding the earth with life. So some people have postulated that the idea that, that life gets from here to there and one of, one of the ways that, that life um, um, emerges on new planets is because of water bears being smashed into it from other planets. Um, highly improbable, but still, uh, it just speaks to how profoundly unique these organisms are and how different they are from all the other life forms on or Earth or on this, uh, this new planet here in transmission. Water bear.